start with kind of the modern civil rights movement with the with the murder of Emmett Till. Because when those photos were published, it's like people around the country and around the world really saw what it meant to be black in the South. Let's talk about John Lewis, who just just as a segue, when I was when I was at the Lorraine Motel five days ago, whatever it was, I had this moment where I just sort of stood there to take it in because because I'm I'm standing there right in front of the hotel, the balcony that has the famous picture where Dr. King's body is on the ground and and all of his people, including John Lewis, they're standing there and they're pointing in the direction where the shots came from. And and it was it was sort of I'm getting chills talking about it because it was this surreal moment of John Lewis just passed away um, a month, two months ago. And even even at the very end, I mean, there's that famous picture of him standing on the Black Lives Matter mural in Washington, D.C., and he was probably a month away from death at that point. He was still fighting for civil rights until the very end, and I'm standing at the point where Martin Luther King killed was killed in 1968, and to know that John Lewis straddled that, that he was in both of those places, it's... It, it's just this life well lived of service and dedication and refusing to give up the fight, which I think is just so worthwhile and worthy of all of the things, all of the good things. Yeah, I totally agree. And I also like John Lewis is just fascinating too, because yeah, his life reminds us of how not long ago that was. I think he was the reminder. So that's why, right, Congress called him like the conscience of Congress. He was there just as this living reminder I would say nobody, but I will say almost nobody even dared to ever speak ill about him or, or say anything because he just like, what could you say to someone like John Lewis? Um, and so, yeah, he was born, let me see, he was born in 1940. So he was the same age as Emmett Till. Um, he was born in Troy, Alabama, third of 10 children. They were share, oh sharecroppers as well, right? So that ties all the way back to the reconstruction era of oh, understanding absolutely. that- yeah, like you you can't go get your own land. Often you're prevented from being able to buy land. And so you basically just have to rent out the land often from the person that had enslaved you. Um, and you're kind of stuck in this constant cycle of debt. Um, and so- You're never able to make enough money to leave the land, but but you have to, like you're stuck there because that's the only thing that you have to provide for your kids. It's feudalism. It's essentially like serfdom or something, right? Where um, and so it's one of those where then they get stuck in this cycle and a lot for a lot of people they're probably looking around going how is this really much different than before sure. 1865 um, yeah. and so he was born in 1940 so he was born in Troy he he grew up it sounds like mostly in like a, a very black community because he says by his own story that I think in the first maybe 10, 10 or so years of his life he'd really only interacted with two white people ever. Um, and so to me, I think this is important because, right, like that first decade is your, that's your formative years where you're establishing the norms, right? Like you're right. establishing what's normal and what is to be expected. And so even though he grew up in Alabama in, in the Jim Crow South, he also kind of uniquely grew up where he probably didn't feel like a victim of oppression very often. Right. Everybody like him. So, yeah. So then he starts venturing as he gets a little bit older, like pre-teens kind of. He starts venturing into the main part of town and he wants to go to the public library and it's segregated. And he starts to really experience this. Um, and he has said, right, that Emmett Till was his George Floyd. And you can totally see why. They were the same age. Um, and so when he learned about Emmett Till, this is the same time within within that year that the Montgomery bus boycotts were starting in his home state where he lived. So he's hearing and seeing the photos of him at Till. He's also like in his home state hearing about the boycott and starting to hear Dr. King on the radio. And so he says that like 1955 was when he became, you know, mobilized or decided he wanted to dedicate his life to civil rights. Um, he applied to go to Troy University and was denied because of his race. And this is the part that I think is adorable and also amazing is that he wrote a letter to Dr. King and was like, this seems unfair. What should I do? And not only did Dr. King write back, he like invited him to just chat. Right. So like, yeah, he was like, well, let's just talk about it. So, um, yeah, Dr. King was his college counselor and right. basically Dr. said, 
my mentor when I was in high school. No big deal. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, you know, why'd you why'd you decide to come to Fisk University? Well, a guy named Dr. King told me to, so I thought I, I guess, you may have so. heard of him. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Um, and so he, um, what, what Dr. King says is basically, he's like, look, you can sue the school and, and the NAACP will support you. We could try to make this a test case for trying to end these sort of practices in on colleges. He's like, but you're putting yourself and your family at risk, right? It's like the story you told about Emmett Till's grandfather on the stand calling out the white men who, who killed his son. And so, um... John Lewis eventually decided to instead go to Nashville and go to Fisk University, which is a historically black college, right? Those were created in the days of Reconstruction, um, where it was sort of this safe space where black people could could go and learn and get an education. A higher education. Yeah. So he goes to Nashville, and then he immediately, like, hits the ground running. He's one of kind of the founding members of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. When I think of these moments in, in especially the Southern Civil Rights protests, of nonviolent protesting. You're in a march and, and they're, they're launching, you know, police dogs at you or fire hoses and you just take it. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I don't, I don't feel like I have that in me. I don't feel like I have that kind of strength and that kind of courage. And it's so inspirational. Yeah. I think it's something that gets lost in that narrative is that like Dr. King's whole thing was like, yeah, go break the law because the law is unjust and we need we need to just use our body. We have nothing else. All we have are our bodies. And so we can use our bodies to do that. And so John Lewis was like a convert to that right away. And really was probably the most dedicated just by the length of his life and career to that. So when he becomes a student in Nashville, he organizes the sit-in movements there, which end up integrating the all of kind of the lunch counters and that sort of thing in the city. Um, he's also one of the original 13 freedom writers. Right. So he in 1961, right, he's one of the 13 of these. There were seven black people, including John Lewis and six white people who just got on buses in Washington, D.C. and rode it all the way down to New Orleans. Um, so that I guess the idea is right when you reach the point or reach the state line when now it's it's supposed to be segregated, you are now breaking the law. Um, and so they did that as sort of a push to um, integrate, especially. Tell me if I'm wrong. To me, the, the rationale for that, which is really smart, is that the federal government can step in if it's interstate commerce, right? Right. right. And and what they were they were protesting, these are these are different from the city buses that Rosa Parks was a part of that protest. Mm -hmm. These were essentially protesting, the Freedom Riders were protesting the bus stations. So they would arrive across the state line in the south from Washington, DC or wherever and they would be forced to go to the blacks only section. Um, and and so it's it's not just the interstate buses, it's the bus stations. They were firebombed, they were beaten. There, there's famous photographs of, of John, John Lewis bloodied um, getting off a bus where he was just immediately attacked and beaten. And, and again, just to take that, just to say this is, this is this is an immoral law. This is an unjust law yeah. simply based on a person's skin color. I think too it's also so smart, right? This is the thing also that I think people don't understand is how like coordinated and organized and intelligent these protests were. We like to think they were like flash mobs of like, oh, I guess we're all just not going to leave. It's like, no, you have meeting after meeting. Like the only thing I've seen that has come close to that is when I saw those kids from Parkland like sitting down and organizing the March for Our Lives. I was like, that's that's what they did, right? It's like you sit in rooms and have boring meetings where you're discussing and debating strategy and you have to make phone calls and you have to like do all this work, which to be clear, that was mostly the work of black women in the civil rights movement, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, and then you get on the bus and it's like the the intelligence to go, okay, well, let's be strategic. The, fe the federal government can't say this isn't our issue because they, by the constitution, can regulate interstate commerce. Exactly. We're going to cross state lines. Like, it's it's smart and again you're still putting yourself in harm's way to be driving up to a bus station and see mobs right. of people police and civilians ready to just beat you it's terrifying mm -hmm. to willingly put yourself in a position where you know you're going to get attacked and you do it anyway because it's the it's the right thing it, it's yeah I, i'm just i'm blown away by by that kind of bravery yeah, and so so that, I mean, he goes on many, many freedom rides, right? And they do get some help from the federal government who is kind of supporting, but then JFK asks for what he calls a cooling off period, which I'm like, I'm sh 
sure didn't go over quite well with, you know, black Americans are like, oh, don't tell me to calm down, right? That's the worst thing you can say to people who are mad. Um, but so then, then the other event that he's most known for is the March on Washington, right? So, and I should say the Freedom Rides, he was 21 years old, um, which is just crazy to think about. And so then he's 23 during the March on Washington and he's one of the organizers because he's now the chairman of SNCC. And so, or, and so he's organizing along with Ralph Abernathy and Bayard Rustin and Dr. King. And I should say they're all relatively young too. Yeah, this I is think he was in his 30s. Young, early 30s. He was like my age when he's giving his yeah. I Have a Dream speech. So it's it's fun to think about them as like the old guys, but they weren't really either, you know? And so, um, and so because he's one of the organizers, he gets to give a speech at the March on Washington. And, you know, in the room back sitting behind the Lincoln Memorial in this like, I guess, little conference room that's back there, they were kind of getting ready to go out. And people were looking over his speech and people were scared because he was being pretty radical. He was basically saying like, this isn't enough. We're not gonna wait forever and there will be a mass movement. And he said things like revolution, which we're in the middle of the cold war. That sounds communist-y, right? right? And so um, and so they multiple times were like editing his speech right beforehand to the point that John Lewis was in tears. He was like a 23 year old guy getting his paper edited by like the most important people in the world. And he's like, I I just want to get to speak. Like he was worried they were going to cut him at the last minute and say, you can't speak. One of the things he he had in his um, in his speech was basically saying whose side is the federal government on, right? This very sort of combative, like calling out Kennedy and saying like, you say you're with us, but you don't seem, if you're not with us, you sort of are on the side of the oppressor. And they said like, we don't want to anger the, the, you know, the administration, right? There's this whole political element, which especially young people, have a hard, not have a hard time understanding, but are just less, have less patience with, right? And so he ended up going out and giving this like amazing speech. You can go watch it and go read it. Um, And he does include some of that stuff. He says like, there's a revolution in the streets. And like to have a 23 year old young black man saying those things, even though we know he's a proponent of nonviolence now, like that's that on its own. I mean, he was kind of seen as the more radical version of some of the things Dr. King was saying. Um, at that same march. So after the March on Washington, I mean, really like in John Lewis's life, right, there's sort of these three in in this era of kind of the the early to mid 1960s, right? So you have the Freedom Rides, um, then you have his speech at the March on Washington. In that time too, he's also within a year or so organizing Freedom Summer to do this like voting drive um, down in the South. And then the March on Selma. Right. And so that's when he really becomes a national celebrity because he is one of the people, one of the two people in the front of this march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And it's the first march, not the march where it all happened nicely and Dr. King was there. This is the first march where it turned into Bloody Sunday. Right. And so he had, he fractured his skull. Um, He had scars on his head for the rest of his life from being beaten. There's one of the most famous pictures from Bloody Sunday is of him. And it's, to me, one of the most eerie parts of the photograph, this might seem trivial at first, is like, you can still see he has his backpack on. So like his famous photo is he looks like a college student. I mean, at that point, maybe he'd graduated, but he's still in his young 20s and he's walking with his backpack, kind of like thumbs hooked in the way you walk around with a backpack across the bridge and then the next photo you see is it's clear it's him because he still has it on and it's just um yeah and so he and he was one of those that really um that really also fought to uh, kind of allow dr king to then come and participate in the second march on selma full disclosure some of this information is coming mostly from the movie selma but it's a really it's a really good movie um is that there was there was sort of this debate about, well, well, where was he the first time, right? Dr. King, it was, it was, I think he, I think he'd been advised it was not safe for him to be there, which I guess could be said of any time. But I think there was some frustration that Dr. King wasn't there on the first March. Um, but then of course he was the second time when they had, they had eventually gone and kind of gotten permission or tacit permission from the government. Um, and so then they marched successfully, which kind of, among other things, leads to um, the Civil... Wait, the Voting Rights Act is 1964, right? And then the Civil Rights Act of 1965. It's flipped. It's flipped. (laughs) The Civil Rights Act is the big umbrella win in 64. Voting Rights is 65. Yeah. Um, And so he's... I mean, he's he's there. He's there at... at He's like the Where's Waldo of the Civil Rights Movement. He's... For real. He's in all the places. 
Um, yes. And then, I mean, he, he's going to continue. We could do a whole other episode on his then career. That wasn't even his career. That was like his education. And yeah. then obviously he goes, he's, he gets really involved in continuing to organize politically. Then he gets on the Atlanta City Council. And then he runs to be a rep, um, representative in the U.S. House. And he's elected in the 80s, um, I think 1986. So, um, you know, for, for reference, if anyone wants to maybe feel old or young or whatever, he's been on the House of Representatives as long as I've been alive because I was born in 1987. So, um, crazy. so this last month is, is the first time in my life that I've lived in a country where John Lewis was not in Congress. Well, and, and you think about like your entire lifespan, he was in Congress and and that's not even really what defines that's it. That's his third act. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean that that to me is just in, insane and and honorable and like you said, he started at age seventeen, I guess, like being involved with Dr. King. Yeah. And and Dr. King was assassinated when I was one year old. So wow. so. I know, I'm old. Um, <laughs> no, I wasn't saying wow for that. I was thinking like, no, oh, that's interesting because like I have this one year to like him, John Lewis being elected and you have a one year to Dr. King, but. Because, because I say it and I'm like, oh, I am old because Dr. King to me is black and white photographs. I mean, yeah. it's like the, the early civil rights movement is still a lot of black and white photographs. And, and to think that John Lewis was a leader in the movement during the black and white photograph time, and now he's he's just been gone for a month or two. And he was on Twitter. Like, the fact that he was then on Twitter isn't, like, to think about that, to think about he was born to sharecroppers, he was the age of Emmett Till when Emmett Till was murdered, and then yeah. he had a Twitter account where he used Twitter to spread a message of social justice. Like, I yeah. can't think of a more interesting span of a life. I mean, I guess the, the optimistic way to say all the, the sad stuff I've been saying about how frustrating he must feel he also must feel very, very like motivated to think, okay, now we have a new generation that's taking off right. with this. Cause there was a time, there were some decades where it kind of felt like we thought we saw that we're all colorblind. And so on the other hand, like for him to die, but knowing that like his legacy was being carried on by another, a new generation of people, he's sort of like, my watch has ended, right? <laughs> and yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm ending it off. And, and from, from the news footage that I saw, I was, I was in Washington, D.C. the day before the anniversary of, of the um, Martin Luther King I Have a Dream speech rally recently. And and so as I was walking around the Washington Mall, there were a lot of people there wearing Black Lives Matter shirts walking around the Washington Mall. And there were there were some pretty elderly people and there were a whole lot of young people. Yeah. Uh, people who were teenagers who were in college and that in and of itself is is proof that this work that John Lewis started way back in the 1950s it's still continuing on even though his his part in it is done his role is done but the impact of it is continuing because it was it was a it was a majority young crowd yeah that that was setting up for this i mean i i saw the news news footage of the next day it was a huge crowd yeah. and and it, these are people who are who are way younger than I am, who are younger than you are, who are as passionate as John Lewis was in the early 1960s and are now moving it forward. Yeah, it's sort of like John Lewis is like the guy that gives no one an excuse. Like no one has an excuse. It's like, I'm too young. Well, he was 15 when he wrote a letter to Dr. King and got yeah, college right. advice. And then people are like, I'm too old. And it's like, well, I mean, how, right, how old was he when he just passed away? I guess I should look up. I, his... I have stage four pancreatic cancer and I'm still going to get out there and yeah. march and push and. No yeah. excuses. No, it's, that's right. the John Lewis rule is like, no one is, una is in incapable of, of doing that work. And you and I will just go keep teaching about stuff that some people right. for some reason don't want us to teach about, right? Um, right? We'll all sort of do our part. And we'll make more videos like this, I'm sure. Absolutely. So, awesome. Um, cool, well thanks, Kathy. It Thank was great you, talking everyone. to you. Yeah, I think that was, that was awesome. It was like we planned that out. And who knew? Because we like wrapped it all together? Whoa, we're so good at this.